My name is Charlotte Singer Swap. I'm going to start with a brief history of uh, my parents and um, go on from there. My uh, mother is a uh, four generation Mormon. My father, his mother was a convert to Mormonism in Germany in her early teens. My grandfather, he joined the uh, Nazi party in 1923. My grandfather promised my grandmother that he would join the Mormon religion before they got married, and he didn't keep that promise. My grandparents met in New York. My grandmother was visiting her sisters that lived in New York, and he was, uh, he jumped ship. He was par part of a merchant marine, and so he was working and trying to uh, make a living because the economy in Germany was, uh, very bad. And so my father um, was born in Brooklyn, New York, and then they moved back to Germany when he was like one years old. Their marriage was very difficult. You've got a Mormon and you've got a Nazi. Before my grandfather went to war, he enrolled um, my father and my uncle in, in an elite uh, SS prep school, which they were there for a year and a half about. But then my dad and they caused problems to where they were kicked out and they hated it. They didn't want to have anything to do with it. My uh, father and his siblings went through the war, had a very difficult time. All the singers, all on my father's side, the singers, they were killed except for like three of his aunts. My dad got a letter from the U.S. consulate stating if he wanted to continue to be a U.S. citizen, he would have to move to America. So when he was 15 years old, this is right after the war, he moved in, in um, 1946, moved in with his uh, uncle and aunt, and his mother and three siblings soon followed after that in 49. My dad, eventually moved to Utah. They were in New York for three years, but their main goal was to come to Zion, mm -hmm. where the church was, where the truth was. And they earned money and eventually um, made the trip across the nation. And um, when he got into the Valley of Utah, he was so, he was so thrilled and he just ex um, poured out his heart and was saying, oh Zion, oh Zion, he was so happy to be with the true church. And my aunt, she was looking up at the dry hills, no trees. She thought it was very ugly compared to Germany and the um, and so eventually he moved to Marion and he was working for his uncle. They did a lot of studying in Mormon theology, the Mormon gospel. He promised dad two and a half acres. He picked a place out and the whole farm was 160 acres that my, that his uncle had. And so he was working for that property, and like I said, they would get together and they would study the word. 
or I should say the Mormon, the Mormon scriptures, yes. Eventually, he met my mom. She was the homecoming queen, popular, beautiful, vivacious, and he met her in the uh, cafe in Camas. And he would started talking to her, and she kind of thought he was weird because he, you know, he had this ruddy complexion and very German accent. But eventually, they got to know each other. They dated a little bit. My mother's mother, my grandma on my mom's side, could not stand my father. <laughs> she wanted, there was, mom had other boyfriends that, you know, very nice, clean cut, and nice Mormon guys that wanted to marry her, but mom was attracted to my father. And they had to elope because the family was so opposed. They were was, active LDS. Yeah. When mom and dad got married, they were active LDS. They paid their tithing. They, they did everything that you do. When they would go to church, when my um, father would go to church, the more that he studied on his own, the deeper that he got, he could see that the modern day LDS teaching wasn't uh, matching up with the fundamental teaching of Mormonism. And so when they would teach in, in Sunday school, they would have their class church manuals and Dad was a person that was, he would question, he would put his hand up and say, excuse me, and disrupt the meeting and say, well, it says here, you know, in the scriptures, this doesn't coincide, this doesn't go together. They just wanted him to be quiet, listen. And so he, one time he said, well, you know, if we're not gonna use this and this, these two situations, they don't go together. Let's just, you know, rip this page out of the out of the uh, Mormon scriptures, and we'll throw it away. So he was he wasn't popular. He was outspoken. Well, first of all, he was unpopular because he was German, and with the war, with the war, you know, America. And then you hear how this. Yeah. And then him marrying mom. Mm -hmm. So they got married. They started having children. They lived in this cozy little log cabin home that my father built. Oh, I have seven siblings and I'm, I'm thrown in the middle. So my sisters and my brother was born first. They went to public school and our problems started when my father didn't agree with some of the curriculum that was being taught. And he, he felt that it was his God-given responsibility and right to raise and teach his kids according, according to his uh, beliefs. And so as time went on, he took my older siblings out and um, that's what started uh, problems with the school board. Before he took the, my older siblings out, they were ex my, my parents were excommunicated because they did not honor Joseph Fielding Smith that was the prophet at the time. He, he just said he's not a man of his word, he can't be a prophet. <laughs> so then when my parents were called in before the state president, they asked him, do you uphold 
him as a prophet, and of course they said no. Everybody that was on the school board was on that board when they were <laughs> getting excommunicated, so it was a really close knit, tight community of Mormons. We were like the pioneers. We had the long dresses, we had the braids. Dad believed this was the right thing. This is how the, you know, the saints dress, and that's how we, this was part of our religion. And the, the modern day church was, you know, they, they compromised and they fell away from the truth. And so we were pretty much outcasts. I remember a time when we would go shopping in the little uh, grocery store in town in the middle of the winter and people would be throwing like snowballs at us. And there was a time when we went to the movie and when we came out, we had a dead bloody rabbit that was smeared all over our car. And, and then there was um, inappropriate language while we were in the store people, because yeah, you know, we looked like pioneers and we were these, we were different. So we were very, very unpopular. And did people associate that kind of dress at that time with the fundamentalists? Yes. Okay. And my father did believe in uh, plural marriage and the fundamentals of Mormonism. And so when dad was being fought by the courts, they would go to court, try to work things out. The last time dad and mom went to court, it was like the judge and the prosecuting attorney, the uh, school board. They were just talking over dad and mom as if they weren't there and they were talking about putting us in foster home. And with dad's background, with what happened with them in Nazi Germany, this just, dad couldn't believe that this was happening. He, it was like, what's going on here? Because, you know, he came to America, his freedoms, and, and so dad didn't go back to court. And so when you have a court here and you don't go back to court, you're in contempt of court. And then when uh, the uh, sheriff summons you and you don't listen, then you're pretty much, uh, you're in big trouble. And so it, it escalated to where dad didn't leave the property for 13 uh, months. And in that time, he took a, another wife, which was very controversial, and her children. And it was just a big, it was, it was a big ordeal. Dad would not compromise. He saw what happened to the German people in compromising with Hitler. And when he believed in, he believed in this, that his children weren't the state's property, that they were his, given to him by God to teach and raise. And so he stood on that to his death. He, uh, he told mom that he knew that uh, this would probably be led, this would probably lead to his death, which she said, no, 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 that there is no way. God's, that's not in the picture. That's not part of the, uh, the plan. Well, from the very beginning, dad, we had a lot of news reporters. We had a lot of publicity. We had a lot of people come up and talk and visit. And, and Dad made it perfectly clear, it was on our chalkboard in our living room, that he would never be the aggressor. And that he would only fire unless fired upon. 
So in January in 1979, they were surveilling us and, and trying to arrest my father. Dad was a very upbeat person, very happy, very outgoing, very kind. He would treat like a, a bishop and a drunk the same. He was so big in my life. I would talk with my siblings and I would say, I'm his favorite. And they'd say, no, I'm his favorite. We all felt and believed that we were his favorite. He had so much love for us. Even things when things were going rough, he'd always smile and he'd always uh, very energetic, very loving. And the morning of the day that he got shot, I remember smiling at him and talking because I was getting ready to go out and milk the goat. And I remember he looked right through me because the pressure was extremely hard. So anyway, it, uh, we had a lot of snow that night and he, uh, I had a snowmobile, uh, pardon me, a snowblower to clean out the uh, lane uh, because we were having um, some friends bring us some groceries. And um, we, we always had a pair of binoculars in the house. And so we uh, would always watch the snowmobiles go by and we knew they were, they were officers. So he was clearing out the road, getting ready for uh, company to bring groceries. And um, I was just watching him in the house through the binoculars. And I watched him stop the snowblower, head down to the lane, because at the bottom of our driveway was the mailbox. and. He got the mail and he looked to his right, which were two snowmobiles coming from, uh, I should say from the left, and then from the right, two snowmobiles, and each one had an officer. They had two to a snowmobile. And I remember him getting the mail and turning back up the lane to go home. And then I remember the snowmobiles like chasing him and this is where I yelled to mom and said, Mom, Mom, they're getting dad. And she came to the window. And she was all frantic and, where's my boots? And couldn't find her snow boots. And she came to uh, the window. And what she told me, what she saw is there was a semicircle of officers. And dad had his pistol out and he was going like this like, leave me alone. And then she went away to try, try to find her boots, and I came back to the uh, window the, and looked through the binoculars, and um, he turned around, and I saw his arms go up, and blood come out of his mouth, and he went down, face down, and the, it was like all in slow motion. The snow came up, and and it was uh, horrific. But um, how old were you in this I was uh, ten, ten years old. Then, of course, after that, it was just slow motion. You're in a fog. You're in shock. And of course, I never for a minute thought Dad was dead. That, I, that wasn't, that wasn't even a thought. My little brother saw him uh, throw him in the back of a pickup truck, and they head down the road. And then after that, uh, we were taking, we were taken to a Salt Lake City. My mom was taken to jail. 
and we children were taken to uh, the Division of Family Services. And we spent all day there. And then a social worker came in and said that uh, your dad was shot in the legs and the poison rushed to his heart and he died. And of course we're like, you know, that's a lie. That's an absolute lie. He, Dad's not dead. And we, we didn't trust him anyway. But anyway, we didn't know what was going on. We were in shock. We were upset. We were hurt. But as far as uh, Dad being dead, that, that could never be because he was, he was, uh, he was my hero. He was, he was everything growing up. So a couple of, well, a day or two later, it sank in and we just cried and cried and cried and, until we couldn't cry anymore. And we were at a foster home, stayed there for two weeks, and then we went back home. And when we went back home, that's when it really, it really hit seeing dad's boots on the <laughs> just having him not there it was it couldn't be and then his picture on the wall it was just very very difficult and it just left a huge hole in our hearts. Um, after that, uh, all of our neighbors were happy. They were, we were, we were very bitter. After that, um, we tried to, you know, live a normal life. The school board was still on our backs, and we, you know, had to comply to what they recommended, and that was stressful. Um, then uh, we met up with the uh, attorney Jerry Spence, and he filed a wrongful death uh, suit against the state, and and against the school board. They denied us a, a court hearing. Um, they kicked it out of court, saying that it was uh, insubstantial uh, evidence, that there wasn't enough evidence to go to court, which was a farce. But, um, and that really hurt because the main problem with our story stems from that we never got our day in court. And for a person to be killed, there, you, you should have a court hearing. Even if, you know, you're not going to get the end results that you want, you should have that. And that was never given to us, which, which was absolutely wrong. Adam, my husband um, came up to the property, to our farm, in 1980. So it was a, a little bit after, a year after Dad was killed. And <sighs> have seen, first, well, when I first met my husband, I mean, when I first met my soon-to-be husband, he. He was, he was a breath of fresh air. He, he was full of energy. He was, he was very positive, very upbeat. Um, and not to mention he was way, way good looking. <laughs> the first minute I saw him, I, I knew this is the one. Him coming onto the scene was such a blessing. It helped fill 
that hole that was there, that was taken. I mean, that was left, I should say. He first married my sister, my oldest sister. And then uh, after he married her, three years later, he married me, which my sister, uh, when they were engaged that night, I was just crying because it was like, <laughs> I liked him so much, and my sister comforted me. Said, "It's okay, it's okay, Charlotte. Uh, Adam can have many wives." And so, just, she comforted me. Which and, and that, was that a source of comfort to you? Oh yes, definitely. Um, and so, I, like I said, three years later, I married him, and we, as a plural family, we had we had a good marriage. I mean, yes, we had jealousies, but it was, we were, we were friends. And like I said, you know, my sister, we were close and growing up. I had a son and one of the greatest joys in my life is to <laughs> have, uh, our son. I had him named before I was even married. I was going to have a boy and his name was going to uh, be John after my dad. And um, it was just great. But then we, of course, were still in this little community. And of course, polygamy is not a good thing. After my father was killed, Our neighbors took us to court to take our property away because we didn't have a legal deed. Because my uh, father's uncle made a covenant back then, and it wasn't on paper. And when you don't have it on paper, you're hit. And he worked for my uncle for that property for 17 years on the farm. We went to court and Thankfully, there were witnesses still alive that knew my dad's uncle, and they were there. And um, the judge awarded us the property and our spring. So that didn't work with getting rid of us, so they went up 100 yards and they uh, undermined our... First, they took our irrigation away, um, and then they took our culinary water almost completely away. And I mean, our, the children were getting sick. There was, it, it was just, the place was dying, all the fruit trees. It just was mounting the injustice, the persecution. But the last straw is water. You can't live without water. And so when they went up there and undermined the uh, spring, they actually put in a whole collecting system that was completely they broke the law. We went to court, pleaded our cause. You know, when you're when you're a fundamentalist Mormon, you're not going to get justice. And so uh, we tried the court system, and so it mounted and mounted. And finally, Adam just went up there, and he, because our water was uh, just running down the ditch, and he took a hose and hooked it to the. Uh, pipe and fed it into our head house and then of course the cops got involved and we explained our case and we and it just mounted mounted and and then we got our uh, father's uh, bloody clothes that they sent from the sheriff's office nine years later and to back up, clear back af after Dad was murdered, yes, he did pull his gun out, but he turned his back on them, and they were run he was running home. And when Mom was in uh, jail, a friend of my father's went with a doctor to the mortuary and they took pictures of his body right there in color photo 
eight uh, buckshot holes in his back. And so with the pictures, with the, uh, the bloody clothes, with uh, not having your day in court, it just mounted. Adam felt like he had to do something. When you really look at it, we were in a bubble. We were in a box. Because what he did, when you really look at it, it's like, wow, where's the foresight in this? You know, what good is this going to do? This is just going to mount to the heartache and pain that's already here, which we can see now. Couldn't see it before at all. Adam makes a bomb puts it in the stake center in the middle of the night and blows it up to make a statement. We were under siege for 13 days. On the last day, Adam went out to milk the goats with his brother. And we didn't know at the time that the lower house on my dad's property, that which was my grandmother's house, there was officers in there. And so when Adam was walking home, um, walking back up the trail from the goat shed with the pail of milk and his gun was slinged over his shoulder, he got shot in the uh, wrist, which swung him around and then they shot him in the chest. And then um, my brother, they set out, the officers set some uh, dogs out and he was shooting at the dogs and said, Adam, Adam, you know. And so Adam comes in, his wrists all just blown apart and at the time I didn't know he was shot in the chest. And so, you know, he said he surrendered so he went down and gave himself up. And that wasn't supposed to happen. I remember looking in the uh, mirror and I was just shocked, which when you look at it now, it's like, of course the end result. But with my upbringing, you know, God was supposed to step in and our enemies were, you know, God was going to take care of them and everything was going to be great. All the children were taken to uh, Adam's parents. We were put in jail. And I didn't know if Adam was alive or dead. I didn't know what was going on. After I went to jail, I went to the halfway house. Then we went through the trial. And I honestly thought the Lord was going to step in when we were in trial. It was... Uh, It was hard. When they picked us up, they put all the adults in a separate uh, car vehicle. And the officers were trying to get me to speak and they said that, uh, they said that an officer was killed. And of course I told them that they were liars. That's not true. And then when I found out that, yes, uh, an officer was killed, I felt uh, a great remorse. We found out later that he had children. And I knew from personal experience that that It was very painful. And while uh, we were going to court, it was a state court, I uh, met uh, Mrs. House in the, uh, in the bathroom at, at the court. And I wanted, to, I wanted to tell her sorry. I 
And I just looked at her in the eyes and I just felt so bad for her. But I was this 18 year old kid and the, um, the judge said no talking between each other and I, I always regretted that. Um, I've written her letters since then, but uh, I'm very sorry for the pain that we have caused their family. You can't bring back life once it's gone. So, uh, with Adam being in prison, my mom was in prison, my brother and my brother-in-law, Adam's brother. Our lives were just completely turned upside down again. But um, through it all, number one, we always, we always kept praying. And my son, he, I had to be strong for him. <laughs> Our main uh, purpose, or was to go visit, take the take uh, the children to visit Adam. Um, Adam had uh, five from my sister, five children, and then I had the one, and so uh, I would take turns and visiting and Adam's parents would uh, and we would split up the children so we would visit and so that was always uh, wherever he was moved to we would go and visit which I have to say that seeing Adam get shot have him put in prison was extremely hard Having our family ripped apart was extremely hard. But the hardest part is that in our blindness, with this holy stand, we hurt a lot of people. A lot of people. And I'm sorry for that, but we hurt our children to where the pain that they went through was seeing their, seeing them cry every time we would leave the prison. And that hurts because we put them through this by our wrong choices. And then of course I thought of Anne and their children. They didn't they couldn't go and see their father. <laughs> but uh, you can't change the past. And I am deeply sorry. <laughs> and our children, they still, they'll carry this with them. But uh, year after year, They would stop sobbing when they would leave the prison, but then they were crying inside. And it's like, uh, I moved to uh, Phoenix to do the last of uh, Adam's prison time. I didn't know how long he had, but our children, you know, got married and moved away. And here I am in this house, and it was like, it was a shock to me the emptiness syndrome and so they would come down and visit um, so uh, back in uh, 2005 Adam was uh, Adam completed his uh, his federal time and he had one to 15 years in state. I just assumed he was gonna come and do a state time. 
in Utah. I just expected that to where we would have somewhat of a normal life. Okay, he's in prison. He's already been there for what? 18 and a half years. And when he didn't, it was the biggest blow. Um, he, they moved him to a state high security prison in, Flor in uh, Florence, Arizona. Um, his record, you know, he never had a shot or he never had a mark in the whole time he was in the federal system. And so when they moved him to this state prison, it was, it, it, it was maximum. It, it rocked, it rocked our lives. Um, we've met a lot of people in our, in our journey with inmates. But where he was put, the inmates there, they were almost inhuman. And it was totally a shock to our souls. It was night and day from where he went. And so uh, he was there for 14 months. And I was, I was very, at that time in my life, I was very, very angry. Because this, my life wasn't supposed to turn out this way. I was supposed to have six kids. I mean, I like I said, I had my son named. Well, I had five more already named too, and I <laughs> and I wanted a big family. God didn't step in. Why, you know, if we did if we did the right thing, you would think eventually we would see some fruits from this uh, stand, and. Eventually, uh, Adam had his experience with Jesus in that prison, and he apologized. He apologized for everything he did, and that was like a sore to me because so all these years. Everything we stood on, all the pain, it was all wrong, and it was like, wow. I wanted to die. I wanted to, I wanted to completely erase my whole life. I didn't want to be Charlotte Singer Swap. I wanted to be anybody but. I was so angry, so hurt. First of all, I didn't want to be wrong. I had a lot of pride. The beginning of the first trial, they gave him a plea bargain. He would have spent nine years at the most. And he didn't take that because we knew that we were standing on the truth. So now I was angry and confused. I guess I wasn't so much as angry with Adam. I was just angry at my life. I was angry that Everything was a waste. I believed everything was a waste. There were times I wanted to die. I mean, literally. But then, like I said, we were always, we always prayed. God protected me and watched over us. He helped us through the, the years. He answered prayers. I mean, before I would go visit, I was scared because here I am, I was raised on this two and a half acres in this box and now I've got to travel to different states and it was scary and um, I'd always pray, Lord, be with me and if there's something wrong with my car, let it break down before I leave so I can get it fixed and sure enough, I kid you not, a week before, a couple of days before, the car would break down, 
get it fixed and we were on our way. Adam's parents were, I have to say, were uh, always there. They uh, always gave me money to pay for the trip. They were such a support. But as far now as where I was, all the kids are gone. Adam's saying that it was all wrong. And I'm just like, I don't know, I'm confused and messed up. And he kept saying to me on the phone, get in the New Testament. And you know, I, I've read the New Testament before. I read it with uh, a filter on though, because I didn't uh, respect the Bible. I didn't respect, I didn't respect it whole, as a whole because it was corrupted from what I was taught. And it started making me angry because he'd ask me every day, did you read the New Testament? I'm like, no. And he's like, Charlotte, it will change your life. I kid you not. It's alive. And he would say it every day and it was just like, oh, be quiet. And so I would read it a little bit. Just to, just to when he asked me the next day, did you read? Yes, I did. I was like, you know, please be, shut up. And I slowly got into it more and more. I was on the, uh, the computer and I was surfing and I, I saw this black and, white, black and white picture of this man with a big woolly beard. And I thought, man, that looks, kind of looks, it reminded me of Brigham Young. And so uh, I started reading about this person. His name was D.L. Moody. I, I, I've never heard of D.L. Moody in my life. I didn't know anything about him. And I started reading about him and uh, Ira uh, Sankey and how he was an evangelist and how he went out. And I just started reading his story and it was just like, wow, this is, this is really neat. Um, he had a deep love for people and their souls. And this doesn't make sense because, you know, all the creeds and all the sects, they're all, they're all corrupt. They're an abomination, and it's like, so I, I, I didn't really know how to deal with that, and so I just kind of put it aside, but I still read about him, and then I started reading about other um, pastors, and I was, I was reading about uh, George Whitfield. I was reading, and oh, and George, uh, George Mueller loved his story and how he was, uh, he wasn't a good person. <laughs> he was uh, very problematic for his parents, uh, an alcoholic, um, a gambler. He, he was just a, just a problem child. And the Lord got a hold of him and turned his whole life upside down and how he opened this uh, orphanage and he took care, I guess in his life over, he took care over a, a 10,000 orphans and he was a praying man and the Lord answered his prayers. I mean, he wrote down every um, answer to, he wrote, he kept a log and I was doing some research and he was born, um, he was born September the 27th, 1805. So he was born three months before Joseph Smith. And he did amazing work for God. Amazing work. Loved the Lord. And so I'm reading about Charles H. Spurgeon and I'm reading about these men that love God. Because with me growing up, we had the truth, and everybody, everything else, everyone else, pretty much, they were hit. They didn't have the truth. As a young girl, 
There was no question. That was just how it was. We were doing right. Everybody else was doing wrong. Very close-minded. So when I started reading about these God-fearing men that really loved the Lord, I'm like, how does this fit? This doesn't fit with, uh, with what Joseph Smith said. Because they had nothing to do with uh, the LDS Church. And so I slowly started to realize that God existed outside of the only true and living church upon the face of the whole earth. When I was going through this, this heartache and this, this anger, I went into this re re retail store Tuesday morning in Sandy. And I was just walking down the aisles. I mean, I was, I was just, just so hurt and so empty. I was so empty inside. And I see this little five by seven picture and it's this uh, laser print, Jesus name, beautiful uh, calligraphy laser print. And at the bottom it said, it was, there was a scripture verse, John 1.1, 1, 1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word um, was with God, and the Word was God. And seeing that picture, I, uh, it's just like the darkness that I was carrying dispersed. I mean, it, it, it softened my heart, and it touched me. And so I bought it, and it just meant a lot to me. And it was like the Lord was giving me these, these gifts, leading me on this journey towards Him. And I didn't know I didn't have Him, really. But I have to say, back when I was young, I believed in God. Dad would give me a blessing and I'd get better. But did I ever think of Jesus? God was God, but I never... Th the only time I thought of Jesus, it was probably my father that read um, Joseph Smith's first vision that he had in the grove. That was my first thought that I can remember of Jesus. And so it was tied in with Joseph. The first time I ever heard that story of his first vision, it made a profound impact on me. I mean, I pictured myself in his shoes. I pictured me being in, the, in a wooded area because that's where we lived. I mean, you walk out the door and bam, you're right out in the woods. Um, I pictured having the dark's um, presence or power bind my tongue. I pictured seeing the father and, and the son come through the trees and talking and that and with them saying that they were all corrupt. You cannot don't join any of them. I mean, at a very early age, that was that was truth. And I believed every word of it. And when I came home from Phoenix in 2013, my son, my, my other son, um, said to me in a facetious way, so, uh, so what version of the first vision do you believe in? And I'm like, what in the heck are you talking? What do you mean, what? what version he says because you know there's like uh there's like eight or nine different versions and i didn't say anything because first of all in my mind it was whatever you're reading boy this is uh anti-mormonism these are just wicked men that don't you know that hate joseph and I didn't say anything because I didn't, I didn't know that there was more uh, versions of the first vision. Never heard that before. But then I never 
being raised in Mormonism, you, I never questioned it, never questioned it for a, a minute. It was the truth. I had the truth. I had the fullness. And whatever anyone else had, well, sorry, you know, you're corrupt. So then uh, Adam went before the parole board and finally he got a release date. Now, going through having your husband in prison is one thing, but not knowing when he's coming out is a total um, different story. We never, we didn't have the release, we never had a release date. We kind of knew, you know, we could spend up to 30 years. But it was like, for me, there was no, there was no light at the end of this prison tunnel. And when we finally got a date, I was, uh, we were calling uh, the parole board every day to see if they got a date, to see if they got a date. Well, it was my mother-in-law's turn to call, and so I was um, running some errands, and I was in Anthem. I was living in Anthem, um, Arizona and I was mailing some things at the post office and she called me and told me Adam's date was July 9th of 2013. And I just, I was in my car with the windows up and I just started screaming, screaming at the top of my lungs and just crying and it was just like a flood of tears. I just couldn't believe that we finally got a date. And it was, it was our son's birthday. <laughs> and so I didn't have to get him a present that year. <laughs> Actually, I have to tell you this. When we, Adam did come, um, when he, did, he was released, I got this huge box. And I wrapped it and put holes in it and a hole through the head. And I put a big, huge bow on Adam's head and walked him out and said, Happy birthday, John. This is your birthday present. It was a very, very special day. But uh, to go back, while I was living in, in Glendale, Arizona, this was the same time that I was reading about all these awesome Christians that really love the Lord. I was also comparing Isaiah in the Book of Mormon with the Isaiah in the Bible. And I'm trying to prove that Joseph Smith is a prophet. This is true. Oh good, you know, this has changed a little bit, but it doesn't change any of the information. And then I would come on to something It was like, Oh, wait a minute. That's not in the Bible. That's, that's totally different. I'm like, oh man, oh, I didn't like that. But I just kept, I, I kept comparing the two. And then shortly after that, my brother did extensive research, studying. One night he said, I don't believe anymore. And he said, it was like heavy chains. Just, he said, I could see him fall off me. Well, he tells me this, and of course, it's like, oh, I mean, it hurt so bad. It was like, oh my, heck, he's turned from the, this, the only truth. I felt that he was deceived, and I cried and cried, and I just thought, oh, and I was praying to the Lord, please, please send him a nice Mormon girl that will a fundamentalist Mormon girl because of course I was, you know, I had my testimonies. I had my testimonies at a very early age. It was, uh, I can still remember the year, it was 1980. And my first testimony of course was when my parents read the first um, vision that Joseph Smith had. And then I had some significant spiritual experiences that 
completely welded it within my heart. This is the truth. I'm talking strong, strong feelings. I knew Joseph Smith was a prophet. I love Joseph Smith. I revered this man. Growing up, I thought of Joseph Smith, Brigham Young, and John Taylor. I read more about them. Like I said, I didn't think about Jesus. Jesus was at the end of my oatmeal prayer in the morning when we had breakfast. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. Jesus is over here. Joseph Smith, Brigham Young, John Taylor, they were all here. And I really respected these men. But anyway, um, to get back to about what my son said about uh, the first vision when he threw that at me. I found out that the first vision that they have record of is actually in Joseph Smith's handwriting. I thought, well, man, I really want to read this. This is the first take of his first vision. This is the first record. What does this, you know, what does this say? First of all, Joseph Smith had the first vision in 1820. Twelve years later, the first written account was uh, 1832. And so I'm reading along, and in this vision, Joseph, Joseph quotes Psalms 14.1. Well hath the wise man said, it is a fool that saith in his heart, there is no God. And then it talks about here, I was filled with the Spirit of God, and the Lord opened the heavens upon me, and I saw the Lord. And he spake unto me, saying, Joseph, my son, thy sins are forgiven thee. And I'm thinking, wait a minute, thy sins are forgiven thee? This isn't in the uh, official 1842 version. There, there was nothing about Joseph sinning. And then it goes on, Go thy way, walk in my statutes, and keep my commandments. Behold, I am the uh, Lord of glory. I was crucified for the world, that all those who believe on my name may have eternal life. It's like, what? This isn't in all those who believe? Wow, that sounds pretty Christian to me. Then Joseph quotes Psalm 14, verse 3, None doeth good, no, not one. He also quotes Isaiah 29, 13, They draw near to me with their lips, while their hearts are far from me. And then Revelation 22, 12 is quoted, Behold and lo, I come quickly, as it is written. Now this is the first he didn't see two personages. This is Jesus supposedly talking to Joseph. There isn't anything be, uh, about him being seized upon by any dark powers. And that was big for me as a child. Wow, you know, the devil's there and he's fighting Joseph. There wasn't any thick darkness that gathered around him in this. There uh, weren't two distinct personages mentioned and which blows me away, because this was big for me as growing up as a child. The conversation about which sect was right didn't occur or wasn't even mentioned. It wasn't even mentioned. And that's the reason Joseph went out to the grove to pray, to say, to see which denomination, which church should I join? It's not there. And this right here, this is the found, supposedly, the first vision that he had is the foundation of Mormonism. So I'm reading this and I'm like, wow, look at this foundation. This doesn't, this doesn't coincide with the 1842 version. The 1842 uh, vision, the official, it just evolved. For me, like I said, growing up, 
Joseph supposedly asked the personages which of all the sects, all the sects, was right. I was answered that I must join none of them, th for they were all wrong. All their creeds were an abomination in sight, that those professors were all corrupt. Now you see this word, all, 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 all. That's a big, that's a big deal. That means all. And the only ones that are really, that are going to heaven, that have the truth, is this new man-made church that uh, Joseph uh, built up slowly. And when I see the first vision, he did get this right. All those who believe on my name may have eternal life. But it changed. So then I started reading in uh, DNC because in the, the official version of the first vision, Joseph said that he saw the Father and the Son. So here in DNC section uh, 84, 21 and 22, which states, and without the ordinances thereof and the authority of the priesthood, the power of godliness is not manifested unto men in the flesh. For without this, no man can see the face of God. According to Joseph Smith's revelation, he should have never left the grove. He should have died that day. So total contrary, it was contradiction right there. And then another interesting fact about the first vision, Brigham Young in 1855 giving a talk in Salt Lake. And he states that the Lord sent his angel. And then this, in this sermon, he says it twice, his angel. And then he said, the messenger. And we know that Joseph and Brigham Young, they were close. And so... If this is the foundation, and here we have Brigham Young, that's second in line, he's saying it's an angel. I mean, there's a problem with this foundation. And Joseph's brother, William Smith, his brother, he said it was an angel. And I'm talking about the first vision. I'm not talking about the other. I'm not getting this mixed up with the other visions that he had. These men are talking about his first encounter in the grove and they're saying angels. That's a big red flag. But what, I'm gonna tell you what brought me out was, of course, my husband, he kept saying, read the word. And I was, I was working two jobs. And when I came home at night, you know what? I did read, but it wasn't, it wasn't, I guess, I don't know, I, I guess it wasn't time. But I, I still didn't respect the word like I do now. But when he came home, he got a job. I sent him off to work, made his lunch, got back up in my nice cozy bed, opened my New Testament, and just slowly, it wasn't like, I'm going to read a verse today or I'm going to read a chapter. I had nothing to do with that. It was, I want to know what's going on in this book. And I started reading it with my little ruler, line for line. And it was like, no way. Wow. And one of my first, uh, one of my first eye openers is, uh, um, what happened with Jesus and the devil and how Jesus kept saying it is written that uh, I've got it written down somewhere here, but it is written that man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word because anytime I would ever see word it's like okay, where's my little orange pencil because I would underline that Growing up as a child the Book of Mormon was right here the Doctrine and Covenants, Pearl of Great Price. It was right here. This is what I read to my kids. 
the Bible was, he was, it was back there somewhere with my oatmeal prayer with Jesus, you know, tagged on somewhere back there. I didn't, I mean, I, I, like I said, I read it, but not with the same eyes, not with the same honor, not with the same respect. I guess you could say I read it through with Mormon glasses on. So I have this little, I have this little history. It's the History of the Mormon Ch Church book. It's a small little 1912. It was my father's. And he had a, a lot of underlining in it. And of course I was raised with, you know, we believe the Bible to be the Word of God as far as it is translated correctly. I heard that. But that wasn't the one that uh, really set in, that wasn't the one that really touched me because when I was reading this look, little book of dads, he had it underlined and it said, I believe the Bible as it read when it came from the pen of the original writers. Now this is Joseph Smith speaking. Ignorant translators careless transcribers or designing or corrupt priests have committed many errors. Now in the little margin my dad wrote, um, Bible corrupt by who? So he had this question. And so I'm reading the New Testament and I'm reading this and I'm thinking, okay, Joseph, if it's corrupt, or let's say there, you know, there were careless transcribers or corrupt priests. You're a prophet of God. God's talking to you. He's working through you. He tells you a lot of stuff. Who did it? Who are these corrupt or careless priests and, and uh, transcribers? When? When did they corrupt this word? When did they corrupt God's word? And what? What did they corrupt? So he makes this broad stroke. And it's like he, do, he doesn't have it. Where's the evidence? But when you establish yourself as, as a prophet of God and you've got your believers, they'll believe anything. And that's what I did as growing up. I believed everything that came out of his mouth. And I believed it over the Holy Bible, over the Word of God. And then below in this same book, it says, Book of Mormon, Keystone of Our Religion. And I'm going to read what Joseph Smith said. I told the brethren that the Book of Mormon was the most correct of any book on earth. Now, mind you, I'm, I'm reading this hand in hand with my New Testament. And he said, and the keystone of our religion, and a man would get nearer to God by abiding by its precepts than by any other book. And I'm already halfway the New Testament. And I'm like, this is, this is crap. And I shouldn't say it in that way, but this, it was like, this is absolutely not true. If anyone would read the New Testament and then read this, that's, that's laughable. It's, it's ludicrous. Near to God by abiding by its precepts than any other book. That really hit me deep because I knew within my heart from reading the New Testament that that's complete falsehood. That is not the truth. So, I compared these three statements, the uh, eighth article of faith and these two quotes from the church history, and it did not add up. And so I read, and I'm, I'm going back and forth, I'm in the Old Testament, I'm in the New Testament, and I read Jeremiah 23, 30. And it says, therefore, behold, I am against the prophets, saith the Lord, that steal my words. 
everyone from his neighbor. And that scripture, steal my words? By these three statements, Joseph stole his word. He stole God's word. And to me, that is the worst thing Joseph Smith ever did. The most egregious thing he ever did was take the word from these LDS followers. Because, of course, in the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God and the Word was God. So in, in essence, Joseph is taking Jesus, because Jesus is the Word, from these people that follow Him. And that, in itself, is the worst thing you can do to a human being. So my thinking started to change, like I said, and I'm going to read some scriptures that just totally contradicts everything that I just read, what Joseph Smith said. Because God isn't a contra he doesn't contradict himself, even though sometimes we don't understand it. But the way Joseph Smith has put it is totally, completely contradicting God's word. Of course, the one, John 1, 1, is one of my favorite scriptures because the word was God. And then Isaiah 40, chapter 8, I mean, pardon me, chapter 40, verse 8, the grass withereth, the flower fadeth, but the word of our God shall stand forever. Now, forever is a very, very, very long time. Forever is forever. And that's Jesus saying that. Matthew 24, uh, verse 35, Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words shall not pass away. My words shall not pass away. This is Jesus. Joseph over here is saying it's corrupt. You can't trust it. You only need the Bible to go to the highest, or you only need to get closest to God is go to the uh, Book of Mormon. It's not true. Okay, and then John 12, 48. He that rejecteth me and receiveth not my words. How can you receive his words if you're not re reading it? I didn't receive his words because I, I rejected it. I, I didn't honor God's word. Receiveth not my words, hath one that judgeth him. The word that I have spoken, the same shall judge him in the last day. God's word is going to judge us, who is God. And then we got Psalm, I love this scripture. Psalm 138, uh, verse 2. I will worship toward thy holy temple and praise thy name for thy loving kindness and for thy truth. For thou hast magnified thy word above all thy name. He's magnified his word above his very name. And for my puny brain, I can't comprehend. I can't wrap my brain around that. But what he's saying is his word is above all thy name. That's pretty big. And... As I would read, I would always see it is written in various forms. Listed in the, uh, and it was listed in the New Testament. I counted over 88 times. But I didn't put in the scripture. I didn't put in that word. I just put it, you know, it is written. or, And so when it's listed that many times, God's, God's telling his people, my word is important. Pay attention. I'm reading this, but then I had, I had this needle um, needling me in my mind about where in the heck did these testimonies come from? Why, Lord? What do I do with this? Because first of all, my husband already left Mormonism. 
my brother left Mormonism, but I didn't care because I need to find out for myself. And so I'm praying, God, show me. Show me, what do I do? And I'm, I'm kind of getting angry because it's like, wait a minute, are you telling me not only the bombing and all that wasn't true, you're telling me that Mormonism was all, it's all a joke, it's all a lie as well. So I'm praying and I turn to, God gave me this verse and it's John 8, verse 31. Because I'm crying. I mean, I'm, I'm torn. I'm on my knees. And because, you know, I think, of, I think of my father. I think of my whole family. Um, they're all in Mormonism. And I love them very much. But it came down to, I love God more. And... I wanted to know what he, what was right. I wanted to know what was right from him. And this is the scripture that he gave me that completely changed my whole uh, life. I mean, all these others have changed it as well, but this scripture <sighs> was the day I uh, took off my long styled old um, Mormon garments that I was that I wore for 28 years um, after I read this scripture I uh, took down all the uh, pit, uh, the Joseph Smith pictures that I had in my living room that I had in my bedroom that I had a lot of Mormon um, decorations and stuff so I will read it, and it spoke right to my soul. Then said Jesus to those Jews which believed on him, If ye continue in my word, then are ye my disciples indeed. And ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. I didn't have any problem. After I read that, bam. Charlotte Singer Swap, the uh, fundamentalist girl that never, ever was going to leave Mormonism, never was going to leave. I had the truth. I had it all. But like the uh, scripture says in Hebrews that uh, the word of God, it's, it's sharper than a two-edged sword. That sword, that sword uh, opened this little fundamentalist heart, <laughs> and it freed me. The word freed me, and this, this was before I even knew anything about the, uh, the different version of the first vision. Um, so it did pierce me completely to my soul and spirit and joint and marrow. It, if you would have asked me last year at this time, Charlotte, you're going to leave Mormonism. I would have told you you're deceived and that a dark spirit is speaking to you or in something to that effect, that you're absolutely wrong. But last year, October 6th of uh, 2014 was my rebirth. And it was Jesus. And it was through His Word, His holy, precious Word, that opened my eyes. And, I, and, and now when I read the Mormon Scriptures, Wow, wow, night and day, I can see right through it. And my, I have to give you another uh, scripture. Psalm 
34.8. Uh, my dear husband sent me this because I was going through a hard time and he, he knew I was not doing well and he sent me this CD of these uh, spiritual songs. Mm -hmm. This is and while he was still in prison? This is when he was still in prison. Because I was, like I said, I was going through that dark, dark 2006 was one of the darkest years of my life. And I've had a couple of dark years. <laughs> but this song, it was um, singing these words, and it's Psalm uh, 34, verse 8. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man that trusteth in him. And I was partaking of his word and I was tasting it and I was digesting it. And when you do that, guess what? You see. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man that trusteth in him. Trusteth, trusteth. That's truth. That's the word in God. And so that I've been feasting on the Lord's Word ever since, and the Lord's Word is <sighs> it's so delicious. It is absolutely delicious. I mean, there, hours would blow by. I would look at the clock and it'd be like, it's 1030. I haven't done anything. I'm still in my jammas. My hair is a mess, and I'm like, ah. But it was every day, and I couldn't get enough of it. And it spoke to me over and over and over again. But then when I was reading the word, I have to, I have to say this as much is because I, I inherited all my dad's books. He had um, Joseph Smith's new translation of the Bible. And he underlined a lot in the Bible, in his new translation. And so I found out later too um, that Joseph Smith put himself in the book of Isaiah and he put himself in Genesis. I mean, in the book that I have of his new translation, I'm not talking just a little tiny verse here or a, little, a couple of words there. I'm talking about pages. And it's like, wow. But then as I've been researching the word of God, it's impossible. It's just not true. Because of course we know that, um, we know that they found the Dead Sea Scrolls in 1946 through 47. And we're talking the complete book of Isaiah. Not just portions, but the complete book, almost 25 feet long. Joseph's not in that book. He's not there. And how is that possible? Because the corrupt priests, they didn't even exist when Isaiah, when the scroll of Isaiah was written. They weren't, they weren't, they weren't even in the ether. And so he's putting himself in, not knowing that what, over 116 or so years later, they're gonna, going to find the actual original text. So let me read Proverbs uh, chapter 30, verse 6. Add thou not unto his words, lest he reprove thee and thou be found a liar. Guess what? I'm sorry to say it, but it's not true. So as I was reading, and getting closer to Revelation, I'm, I had this thought. I read it years ago, if you add or if you subtract anything um, from the book of Revelation, it's a serious offense. And so, um, and I'll read it, Revelation 22, uh, verse 18, for I testify unto every man that heareth the words of the prophecy of this book, if any man, man, shall add unto these things. God shall add unto him the plagues that are written in this book. 
Revelation 22, 19, if any man shall take away from the words of this book, of, of the book of this prophecy, God shall take away his part out of the book of life and out of the holy city and from the things which are written in this book. And so I just, re I, I'm reading this and I'm like, please, Joseph, please, please. Because, you know, I don't hate the guy. Mm -hmm. I mean, I used to really, really reverence this man. And so I pick up. I pick up Dad's book of his new translation, and he, he's changed it. He's added to it. And you know that, I feel for this man, because you don't mess with God. Don't mess with God and don't mess with His Word, because it's very, very serious. And. That was a huge eye-opener for me. And then, of course, my question about why did I have all these testimonies? And then um, Adam and I, we would read Proverbs every morning. And he was reading, and it said in 28, 26, He that trusteth in his own heart is a fool. And I'm like... I'm here. I'm one of the biggest fools because when I look back from after reading the Word and I look back, it was about my feelings. My religion was based, first of all, upon a vision that did not happen the way the official version is, number one. And then it was based upon my various spiritual experiences without knowledge. So my whole religion is based on a pretty rocky foundation. And it was spiritual experiences versus the Word of God. The Word of God is our gauge. The Word of God is our map. The Word of God is everything. And I was thinking if I ever had to leave or if I ever had to, you know, go, what possession would I bring? And it was like the Bible. I wouldn't want to be parted with that. And a very nice warm goose down coat. Okay. Bible, coat, nice boots. But other than that, growing up as a Mormon, you want to go to the highest you want the greatest. You want to go the highest celestial kingdom. And of course, you know, I had that pretty much bagged because I was living plural marriage. I was living, well, I was trying to live the fullness of the gospel according to Mormonism. And so I'm reading the New Testament and I'm reading about the greatest. And then I'm reading about Joseph Smith and what he said about to become the greatest. And so when I would read, I was always comparing, comparing back and forth. And this is how to become the greatest if um, you're an LDS person. And I'm going to quote Joseph Smith. In the celestial glory, there are three heavens or degrees in order to obtain the highest. That's pretty, you know, everybody wants the highest. A man must enter in this order of the priesthood, meaning the new and everlasting covenant of marriage. And if he does not, he cannot obtain it. And that's in the teachings of the prophet Joseph Smith in uh, DNC section 132, verse 4. If ye abide not that covenant, then ye are damned. And in the DNC, they're talking about the new and everlasting covenant. And so to get to the highest, I was raised plural marriage. That was your key into the highest. And now I'm sitting here and I'm reading, okay, Jesus, who is the highest, by the way, says in Matthew 18, 1, at the same time came the disciples unto Jesus saying, who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? Because they had the same desire. They all wanted to be first. They all wanted to be in the highest. They all wanted, I want to be next to you.
that was an issue. And I think it's always been an issue. And Jesus called a little child unto him and set him in the midst of them and said, Verily I say unto you, except ye be conver converted. And to me, conversion is, you got to believe. And become as little children. Ye shall not enter into the kingdom of heaven. Whosoever therefore shall humble himself as this little child. That's not how many wives you have walking behind you. Humility. Humility. How little children are. The same as the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. This is Jesus speaking. Am I going to take Joseph's word for it? Or am I going to take Jesus' word for it? That's what I always did. I had this scale. Jesus died for me. He's my Savior. He bled and died for me on the cross. He gave his life for me. Joseph is a mere man. I'm going to take what Jesus says over anybody. Matthew uh, 23, 11. But he that is, the, is greatest among you shall be your servant. Hey, everybody, who wants to be the greatest in heaven? Get on your work clothes. Start serving people. Start having love. Serving. So it's humility and serving others. Oh, and then I read this, and I almost croaked. Um, this is what Joseph Smith said, and I have to read the full um, statement. Then Joseph Smith said this, I have more to boast of than ever any man had. This is a big word, ever any man had. I am the only man that has ever been able to keep a whole church together since the days of Adam. A large majority of the whole have stood by me, neither Paul. And by the way, I didn't even know who Paul was until I started really reading. Paul, John, Peter, nor Jesus ever did it. Whoa. So he's boasting. I've done something even Jesus hasn't been able to do. That's not good. I boast that no man ever did such a work as I. The followers of Jesus ran away from him, but the Latter-day Saints never ran away from me yet. And so then, it's like every time I read that, it makes me cringe. It's just, it's just appalling. It's prideful. Now over here, what did Jesus say to become, to go, become and you'll go to the highest? Humility. Is there anything h humble in that statement? I, I say no. I say not. Okay, now let's see what Jesus has to say about this little saying that Joseph Smith said. Jesus said this, countering what Joseph Smith said. Matthew 26, 31. Then saith Jesus unto them, All ye shall be offended because of me this night. For it is written, I will smite the shepherd, and the sheep of the flock shall be scattered abroad. What was Jesus doing? He's quoting a scripture that is going to be fulfilled, which is in Zechariah 13, 7. So here Joseph's boasting about not even Jesus' followers stayed with him. Hello, Joseph. This is um, scripture being fulfilled. It was supposed to be that way. They were all supposed to flee. So that was like, that was interesting to me. We were um, reading William Tyndale and his bi biography, which really made a profound impact on me for more reasons than one. Um, he left his country 
for the sole purpose to translate the New Testament in the English language that the layman could read the Word of God. Back then it was only read in Latin and to put the Word in their hands that was his whole life, his whole wish. And he first tried to go through the Catholic Church and work with them and of course that uh, was turned down and there was a person by the name of Henry Phillips that befriended him. There's a Judas in every story I suppose and he turned him in. He got paid for it to pay off his gambling debts. They uh, incarcerated him for 500 days and then October 6th of 1536, October 6th, and when I saw that I was like, I, wow, to me it really, it touched my heart, but he was strangled and then he was burned for printing, for translating the Word of God, and for Joseph Smith to come along and say what he did pretty much takes the Word of God and, and well, and puts it in the trash. Um, so he did a great injustice to the people because the Word, the Word, like I said, the Word is everything. And so uh, I'm just on this journey of, of reading and it's a whole new world. It's a whole new world. And Jesus is everything. He's everything. And I just want to share that. Adam knew how serious I was about my testimonies. When he came home, I was still wearing the old style garment. Now we haven't been, we weren't together for, um, it was over 25 years. And so here's, you know, he's a Christian and I'm still this fundamentalist Mormon wearing my old style, style garments and r respecting Joseph as a prophet. Adam was very patient. He just wanted me to read the word. He didn't ask me to leave. He was just, he was, I was just so loving. The main focus was Jesus with him. And with me getting in the Word, he didn't have to do anything. The Word stripped me. The Word completely stripped me of all of this false religion. I know that's hard for the LDS people to hear that. Because I remember when I heard that, I didn't want to hear any of that. I had the truth and that was it. And so for me to say this false religion, I'm going to offend a lot of people. And I don't mean to. I don't mean to. It's just that when I came out, I kind of had this, I expected everybody to see it now. Look, guys, here it is. But it's not that way because, of course, it's not that way. My husband came out before me. My brother did. And I didn't see what they were seeing. It's an individual journey. It's not buy one, get one free. God did so, it. There, nobody in a million years, this Mormon girl, this fundamentalist Mormon girl was, I, was never going to leave. And I know it's hurt some of our kids. And I feel bad that it's hurt them. Because I remember, I know how it hurt me. They're on a different journey, and so I can't say I know exactly where they're at. But I, I do know that it hurts. When my brother left, it was just like, oh, man. The Word did it. The Word. And Adam was just as loving and gentle. And pa he wasn't even patient. He, he just, there was this knowing. Everything was good. Hey, we're together, and we've been separated. This is nothing compared to what we've went through, but it's an each individual 
journey. And I don't think one can give it to another. God's got to give it to you. And if he's number one and your focus is on him, I believe that even through all the pain and suffering, good will come. Coming out of Mormonism, we got a lot of, rid of a lot of our old hymns because my all-time favorite was Praise to the Man. As a little girl, I just loved that song. Um, now, um, it's very untasteful. But this song was written by Louisa Steed in 1882, and it pretty much sums up where I'm at and what I believe. And if I can sing it, it and it's called, Tis So Sweet to Trust in Jesus. Tis so sweet to trust in Jesus, just to take Him at His word, just to rest upon His promise. Just to know, thus saith the Lord. Jesus, Jesus, how I trust Him, how I've proved Him o'er and o'er. Jesus, Jesus, precious Jesus, Oh, for grace to trust Him more. Oh, how sweet to trust in Jesus, just to trust His cleansing blood, just in simple faith to plunge me Neath the healing, cleansing flood. Jesus, Jesus, how I trust Him, how I've proved Him o'er and o'er. Jesus, Jesus, precious Jesus, Oh, for grace to trust Him more. I'm so glad I learned to trust Thee, precious Jesus, Savior, friend. And I know that Thou art with me, will be with me to the end. Jesus, Jesus, how I trust Him, how I've proved Him o'er and o'er. Jesus, Jesus, precious Jesus, oh, for grace, to trust Him more. And I just want to say that Jesus said, again, I will reiterate, in Matthew 24, verse 35, heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words shall not pass away. And I just say this and I give this in Jesus' name. <laughs>